All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. All right. So for this week, we were studying lesson four. So and the title of um, lesson four was an everlasting covenant. All right. So I want you guys to repeat after me. We're going to recite the memory text. So. So I, God. Um, repeat after me for the memory text. I, God will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. All right, so I'm going to do like a little quick recap of um, this week's lesson. So basically, just like the title said, it's basically talking about the different covenants that um, God gave to his people and also the significance of different names that were in the Bible. All right. So we're going to basically like read over um, Sunday's lesson. We're going to go through each and every one of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're going to read. We're going to read over them, go through each and every one of them. And before we start, we're going to do a quick word of prayer. All right. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Dear most kind and gracious Father, thank you for this wonderful Sabbath morning that you've given us, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to be able to congregate here, Lord, and for the ones that weren't able to be here, Lord, allowing them to be able to be at home to listen to the service, Lord. Lord, please actually please bless us. Um, please um, help us throughout the lesson, Lord. Um, anything that's coming out of my mouth is not coming directly from me, but it's coming from you, Lord. I'd like to please ask that you please allow each and every individual in here to gain something from this lesson, and also the individuals that are watching, Lord, to gain something from the lesson, Lord. So that it may increase their knowledge uh, about you, Lord. I'd like to please, I'd like to please continue to be with the rest of the service, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right. So, title of Sabbath afternoon lesson. Yeah, okay. So, we're going to start with Sabbath afternoon. So, it says, how many remember distinct, distinctly in childhood a sickness or a touch of pneumonia that made us very ill with the potential for something even worse? In the long, feverish night... We would be awake. We would awaken from half from a half sleep to see our mother or father sitting in a chair beside our bed in the soft glow of the nightlight. Just so, in a figurative human sense, God sat by by the beside of a sin sick world as moral darkness began to deepen in the centuries after the flood. For this reason, He called out Abram and planned to establish through His faithful servant a people to whom He could entrust the knowledge of Himself and give salvation. Therefore, God entered into a covenant with a Abram and his posterity that emphasize in more detail the divine plan to save humankind from the results of sin. The Lord was not going to leave his world un unattended, not with it in such dire need. This week we will look at the unfolding of more covenant promises. So basically, like I said in the beginning, it's um, this, this whole week's lesson is j basically just about the significance of different names within the Bible and also the covenants that God made to his people. All right, we're moving on to Sunday. All right, Sunday, Sunday's lesson was titled Yahweh and the Abra Abrahamic Covenant. Okay, so names cannot names can sometimes be like trademarks. They become so closely associated in our minds with certain characteristics that when we hear the name, we immediately recall these traits. What traits come to mind, for instance, when you think of these names? Albert Einstein, Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, or Dorcas. Each one is associated with certain characteristics and ideals during Bible times. People of the Near East attach great importance to the meaning of names. The Hebrews always thought of a name as indicating either the personal characteristic of, of the one named or the thoughts and emotions of the one giving the name or attendant, or attendant circumstances at, at the time the name was given. When God first entered into a covenant relationship with Ab Abram, he made himself known to the um, patriarch under the name Yahweh uh, as Lord in capitals in the king of Jan Oh, no. Thus, Genesis 15, verse 7 reads literally, I am Yahweh who brought thee out of dot, dot, dot. And the name Yahweh, though appearing 6,828 times in the Old Testament, it is somewhat shrouded in mystery. It seems to be a form of, form of the verb haya, to, to be, in which case it would mean the eternal one, the existing one, the self-existing one, the self-sufficient one, or the one who lives eternally. The divine attributes that seem to be emphasized by this title are those of self-existence and faithfulness. They point to the Lord as the living God, the source of life, in contrast with the with the gods of the heathen, 
which had no, exist no existence apart from the imagination of their worshipers. God himself explains the meaning of Yahweh in Exodus 3, verse 14. I am who I am. This meaning express, expresses the reality of God's unconditioned existence, while it also suggests his rule over past, present, and future. Yahweh also is God's personal name, the identification of Yahweh as the one who brought Abram out of, out of Ur refers to the announcement of God's covenant with him in Genesis 12, verse 1 through 3. God wants Abraham to know his name because that name reveals aspects of his identity, personal nature, and character. From this knowledge, we can learn to trust in his promises. All right. So um, basically, quick summary of Sunday's lesson. It's um, talking about um, the... Abrahamic covenant and also um, the basically the significance that the name Yahweh meant. So like you said in the lesson, um, Yahweh, it could mean, like you said, um, self-sufficient, the self-sufficient one, the, the one living, the eternal living one. And like there's multiple definitions for the um, for the name Yahweh, but there wasn't really one specific one that they, um, you, they, they had, it had um, many meanings to it. So, and also, um, basically, so the, he gave, he told, Ab he told Abraham, or Abram, Abraham, he told him that, um, oh, okay, yeah, he told him about, um, he told him about, um, he told him that name so that he could um, basically, is basically, he used that name to show Abraham, like, what, yeah, his power, his power, and like, um, like what, the characteristics of him, the different characteristics the different characteristics that he had within him. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I'm glad that you you were mentioning that uh, in regards to the names and, and character because you know how God also changed, eventually changed Abraham's name, right? And then um, his name before was Abraham, right? And then he changed it to Abraham, which also showing the, the, I guess the significance and change of character for Abraham also. So when God described himself uh, or his name or his character, it show like you mentioned, his power, his, um, his sovereignty, uh, he say I am. He's showing like his, uh, I guess his his power or or just expressing himself for who he is. Contrast to the other gods that was there during that time also to show that he have power over all th all those gods also. That was a great input. Does anybody else have anything to say based off of the Sunday lesson? No. Okay. All right. So we're moving on to Monday. All right. Monday is titled El Shaddai. All right. Yahweh had appeared to Abram several times bef times before. Now in the above text, Yahweh again appears to Abram, presenting himself as Almighty God, a name that is used with two exceptions only in the books of Genesis and Job. The name Almighty God consists first of El, the basic name for God used among the um, Semites. Though the exact meaning of Shaddai is not entirely certain, the translation Almighty seems that seems the most accurate. The crucial the crucial idea in the use of this of this name seems to be that of contrasting the might and power of God with the weakness and fra frailty of humanity. A literal translation of Genesis 17 verse 1 through 6 would be, Jehovah appeared to Abram and said, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be thou perfect and I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly and thou shalt be a father of a multitude of nations and I will make thee un exceedingly fruitful. This same name also appears in Genesis 28, verse 3, where Isaac says that El Shaddai will bless Jacob, make him fruitful, and multiply him. Uh, a, a similar promise of El Shaddai is found in Genesis 35, verse 11, Genesis 43, verse 14, and Genesis 49, verse 25, passages that suggest the bountifulness exercised by God, El, the God of power and authority, and Shaddai, the God of inex inexhaustible riches that that he is willing to bestow upon those who seek him in faith and obedience. All right, so, um, oh, go ahead. Um, uh, like, uh, um, what, what, I'm, what I'm getting right now is as, um, when in regards to, like, it's the previous Sunday um, lesson and, kind of tra I guess, transition to into a Monday lesson, it is showing also this different characteristic of God and how they represent God in character and overall. But it's also showing us also like if God is able to do all these things and He's Almighty or He's all powerful or He's all knowing, that we need to put more trust in God because um He's speaking over here about El Shaddai, speaking about the all um, um the Almighty God or the um in 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 essence like at the beginning He's saying that God is um Almighty like the Almighty God that's what He means to be El Shaddai 
So if God is almighty and I'm a, I'm a, and I'm a, and I'm a follower of God, right, then, then God should be able to provide for me also. So he's also showing God providence to his children. If I'm a follower of God, well, my father is almighty, then what can he not do in my own personal life? Whether he be talking about sin, whether he be talking about you know, different life struggles or issues, if God is almighty and I'm a follower of God, he should be able to provide that powerful or that, that, um, that power that he, he possesses into my own personal life. I'll build off that statement that he just said. So um, what Eric just mentioned about, you know, what El Shaddai, the God, one of God's many names, and how he shows his magnificent power and how we should have faith in that power. And the story of Abram, Abram to Abraham actually testifies that as well because it shows um, where Abram came from as he was not even part of the Jewish nation. And God pulled him out of a heat, uh, yeah, the, the, the Chaldeans, and he was able to become Jewish and then become the father of this nation, which he wasn't even <laughs> originated from. And it, it shows that these biblical stories are testimonies for us to carry in our own lives. So when we're going through difficult story, we're going through difficult situations, we can look back at how God has led his children. Because it's literally verse say, do not forget where God has led you, thus you'll fall into sin. And that's where a lot of us, that's where a lot of us do fall because we forget how much God has done for us. So when temptations or um, situations arise, we tend to fall because we don't really know who we're following. I, I want to talk about one more thing, as he mentioned, um, the, the last comments he just made. Uh, if you look at the story of Abraham, when God asked him to offer his um, son as a sacrifice, you know, it's also talking about, you know, I guess, if he had to trust in the power of God, that God will provide, like, will provide a lamb. Because if he had not trusted in God, like, you, you better kill, or he, okay, he trusted in that God will provide a lamb, and also he trusted that God, if God allowed him to kill the, the child, God has enough power also to bring that child back to life or give him another child. Because that was the promised son. He was waiting for a son. And that finally he get a son, and then God is asking you to, to crucify that son, right? So now, Unless you trust in the Almighty God and in, in the power of the Almighty God, you won't, you will not follow through. But because you trust in Him, right, in His in His character, right, as a, as a, as your created uh, um, as your God or, or Heavenly Father, or as your provider, then whatever He asks you to do, you're no longer fearful of it because whatever He know, you know He asks you to do, you do it by faith and in trusting that whatever He He desires for you to do will be work in, in I guess in perfect harmony with, with His will, and then He will provide whatever your needs or your desires are. Amen. And uh, I, I like that statement as well because it it puts it yeah it puts it in perspective because I don't know I, li I always like to look at the gospel in a very practical manner and I know like coming up as a youth or understanding the Sabbath right why you're not a why you don't do a lot of the things that youth around you youth that go to your school youth that you work with they do on the Sabbath versus what you do on the Sabbath right and that's part of putting your trust in God. Right. That's part of understanding that, hey, I won't work on the Sabbath and God will still provide. I won't study on the Sabbath and God will still help me get to where I need to be in terms of school. And those and that's, you know, and that's faith first, because um, with the story of Noah, it, he was deemed righteousness by faith. Right. And and a lot of us, we we have to understand that faith is the major 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 topic in the bible you have to exercise that faith at some point in your life you have to believe in god with no proof right you have to trust in what you've seen before and what you have in the bible and then exercise that faith uh, one thing that i'd like to add on that i seen was in the lesson it was on um, one of the questions at the bottom of um, monday's lesson it was basically saying like oh how would you guys feel if um the way that the Bible described God is like they scri they describe them as weak or like you know frail. So how would you guys feel if um God's if um if the way that described they described God was weak and frail? How would you guys feel about that? Oh, yeah, I wanted to make a comment before. Mm -hmm. um, so the title of the lesson, it says Everlasting Covenant. And um, the memory text, Genesis 17, 17, it says, 
I, God, will establish my covenant between me and you and your Abraham and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants. So here, for me, God is saying, I want to establish a covenant with you that I am your God, right? And then secondly, God said, revealing himself to, as you said, that where Abraham lived, he was walking with the Lord, but everyone else around him, there was all these other gods. So God is sh taking him out of that environment and saying to him, I'm going to reveal my character to you. I'm going to reveal to you, when I said I am God, I am El Shaddai, that's a character trait of who I am. I am Lord, Yahweh, I am all-powerful, almighty. So it was kind of like for me it was God, like when God takes us out of the world and we start walking with him, he start revealing to us his true character as we study his word. And here is he's using his word as an example to Abraham, this is who I am. Um, oh yeah, the question was, how would you guys feel if the Bible described um, God as frail and weak? Well, I'll say, well, thank God that the Bible doesn't describe mm -hmm. God that way. But in, in a way, we do get challenged like that in real life. Mm -hmm. We do get challenged um, from people that necessarily does not have a relationship with God who will come to you and bring up at the at in the moment very valid points to hey why would god allow this like one of the biggest things you hear if, if god is so loving why is there evil mm -hmm. right and these are questions that christian pundits and christians apologetics go hundreds of years trying to answer right and that's where the faith come in because there's certain things that you won't be able to an answer with God, right? And there'll be certain things where you just have to exercise your faith, even if no one else did. Like you see the story of Abram. So mm -hmm. I think we get challenged with that a lot. And I think that's how a lot of young people get removed out of the faith because they don't have a strong enough relationship with God. So when people outside of that covenant comes and attacks their beliefs, they don't really know how to defend it. And that's why it's important to stay in your word, study, um, study with God earnestly in prayer. Prayer is extremely important. Um, I, th I think there there is a characteristic of God that could appear as if it's frail and, and weak. Um, um, if you if you look at the way that um, the Pharisees or or the children of Israel about the Jews perceived God to be when He came, right? Jesus Christ when He came, and then they seen that okay, they was under the yoke of the Romans, but this guy comes saying he's a Messiah, but then he's being beaten, right? And he's being persecuted, and then he's being um, spit spat upon, and he's being uh, mock and then he's al he's allowed he'd allow himself to go to the cross and be um and be crucified and as a if you look at that that don't show power right <laughs> because in, a, in the human eyes this, if somebody could do all the same to you i mean you you're weaker than them right but then it it it, it, it shows you based on the bible as we as we're reading those texts it's you're talking about the almighty god i guess his um his character right those things are outside of his character because he knew he had a a, a special mission to accomplish right and and by doing these things right he exposed sin, right? And he exposed Satan for, for, for who he truly is. And then as a result, he was able to gain victory um, at the cross because he, he, he did no sin, right? And then pretty much whatever they did to him was, um, was contrary to God or was, um, was, was not needful because he was not a sinner for them to, be, for them to deserve these things. And that's the reason why he was able to be able to be raised from the dead. So in, 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 I guess in the human perspective or the human eyes, it could appear as if God is weak because if you look at the stories and just read, like, you know, read, that this guy allow all these things to happen to him, that, okay, then he must be weak, right? But really, if you look at his character, th he's not weak based on, based on character. And I'd like to add one more thing to that. So, um, um, just like um, our brother Emmanuel said, um, I like that the Bible doesn't describe God as weak, like for the most part. And the reasons being is because if, if if um it were to show God as a weak person, there a lot of people out here wouldn't be. I mean, there is people out here that are not, you know, believing in God and are not. They don't put their faith within God. But like for I'm um, hopefully for the majority of us in this church right now, we have a strong faith and strong relationship with God because of how the way the, the Bible describes Him. Because somebody like that, like you can't find 
there, there's only one, he's only one God. There's only one person that could be as perfect as how God is. And the things that God has done for us, even today and back then, like, it shows us, like, okay, yeah, like, th- this, this person is legit. Like, you know, like, this is, this is the person that I should be following. This is the person I should be following. This is the, this is the um, route that I should take within my life. T- and I should follow it within his footsteps because he's perfect. He knows everything. He knows, like, he, the, his path is never wrong. That's what I wanted to add to that. All right, so we're going to move to Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. All right, so it's titled From Abram to Abraham. All right, through though the names of God come with spiritual and theological significance, such usage does not end with God alone. Names of people in the ancient Near East were not just meaningless forms of identification as often they are to us. To name, to name a girl Mary or Susie does not make much of a difference today for the ancient Semites. However, human names ca- came heavy laden with spiritual significance. All um, Semitic names of people with have meaning and usually consist of a phrase or a short sentence compromised of a wish or an expression of gratitude on the part of the parents. For example, Daniel means God is my judge. Joel means Yahweh is God. Nathan means gift of God. Because of, of the significance attached to names, names would often be changed, changed to reflect a radical change in someone's life and circumstances. In one sense, however, it is not that hard even for even for modern modern minds to understand the significance of what a person is called. There are subtle a- and at times not so subtle effects. If someone is constantly called stupid or ugly, and if those are the appellations appellations used for them all the time by a lot of people, sooner or later those names could have an impact on how the person views him or her- herself. In in the same way, by giving people certain names or changing their names, it seems possible to influence how they would view themselves and thus influence how they would act. With this in mind, it is not so hard to understand why God would want to change Abram to Abraham. Abram means father is exalted. God changed it to Abraham, which is which which means father of a multitude. When you look at a when you look at the covenant promise in which God says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come forth from you. The name change makes more sense. Perhaps it was God's way of helping Abraham trust in the covenant promise, which was being made to a 99-year-old man married to an old woman who had, who had until this time been, been barren. In short, God did it to help increase Abraham's faith in God's promise to him. Um, so does anybody else have anything to add to that? Happy Sabbath. Happy All right, Sabbath. so as far as uh, Abraham and the name change, it was a character development. Because God gave him a promise, right, a covenant, and said that you will be father of many nations. But he did not tell him how or when. Uh, but the circumstances around that was his wife was, b- was barren, so she couldn't have kid. So to, in order to be a father of many nations, he had to come out of your seeds or out of your children, your offsprings. So... In a way, it kind of compares self-righteousness and Christ-righteousness, right? With Christ-righteousness, we have to wait upon it. But self-righteousness is going about it, doing what God already told you he's going to do and on, on his behalf, right? So that's how Ishmael came about because the wife also had an act of d- disbelief as well. So she heard the promise. She knew that, okay, my husband is going to be the father of many nations, but I'm barren. So I cannot uh, provide an offspring Take it, take upon my maid, and that's how Ishmael came. And God was rough with him because he didn't wait upon the Lord. So if you look at our conditions and um, our relationship, and God says, "I will give you the victory," right? But now we want to go do it off our own strength. We always gonna fail. So when the name was changed, is because now he exercised faith, and that's why he's in, in Hebrews 11, the chapter, the Hall of Faith um, chapter. So I, I, in that perspective, that's how I look at the name change. Yeah, he overcame um, his lack of faith because we only could please God with faith. It is impossible to please God without faith. Yeah, that was a, a very good point by Sid. And one other thing that I wanted to point out of the, um, the section that you read, uh, the power of the tongue. When you tend to call people by a certain name, um, what we don't understand is uh, when you say it enough, it goes out in form. 
that person. So the person starts to um, kind of see themselves as what they're being called. And a lot of times that's how we don't understand how that's kind of degraded us as a race of mostly black people in here or or just uh, minorities for the most part, where we're called certain things or we have certain stigmas attached to us. It makes it very difficult for us to rise above certain situations because oftentimes it's not even so much that we're being put down, but we don't try because we don't have any belief or faith that God can do this for us. So, and I think when we're put in a position to encourage people, when we're put in a position to even be angry with someone, to withhold the power of the tongue and say something nice is very encouraging because you're literally helping mold that person. When you call them something that they don't deserve to be called, you can really like set that person back. I think like for anyone that has kids, like should never call their kids stupid. Or if anyone has ever been called stupid, like, you know, it's something that you have to bring to God and ask God to help you um, feel differently about it because I kind of feel like everyone's capable of, like, what it says in Corinthians, I could do th- all things through Christ who strengthened me. But then you go talk to people and they doubt themselves. They'll doubt themselves doing the work of God. They'll doubt themselves in school, at work, or whatever the case is. And it shows that the fear of the Lord is not in them. And the wisdom's not in them. So they, so we kind of take whatever the world's put onto us and then we take it and we walk around with it as a big burden. All right, great points by Brother Sid and Brother Emmanuel. All right, so now we're moving to Wednesday's lesson, which is titled Covenant Stages. Okay. In those two verses, the first stage of God's covenant promise to Abram is revealed. God approached Abram, gave him a command, command, and then made him a promise. The approach expresses God's gracious election of Abram to be the first major figure of his special covenant of grace. The command involves the test of total trust in God. The promise, though made specifically to Abram's descendants, ultimately includes a promise to the whole human race. In the solemn ritual of the second stage, the Lord appeared to Abram and passed between the carefully arranged pieces of animals. Each of the three animals was slaughtered and divided, and the two halves were placed one against the other with a space between. The birds were killed but not divided. Those entering into the covenant were to walk between the divided pieces, symbolically vowing perpetual obedience to the provision thus s- solemnly agreed, agreed upon. The meaning of the name Abraham underscores God's desire and design to save all peoples. The many nations would include both Jews and Gentiles. The, the New Testament makes it um, abundantly clear that the true descendant of Abra- Abraham are those who have the faith of Abraham and who trust in the merits of the promised Messiah. Thus, as far back as Abraham, the Lord's intentions was to save as many human beings as he could. Whatever nations they, whatever nations they lived in, no doubt, no doubt it's no different today. All right, so basically what I got from this was, is that, um, so basically God made a promise with Abraham, God made a promise to Abraham, and which was to basically, um, just um he he he's doing everything that he can to save all people and just like today and how I, how I made the comparison for it today is that um our goal is cr- as Christians is to bring everyone towards Christ cuz his end goal is for all of us to go to heaven our end goal is for all of us to go to heaven and we cannot be selfish and keep the word with it um to ourselves and not share it with everyone that is around us or everyone that we come across because like like I said our end goal is to go to heaven and because our end goal is to go to heaven, we also have to help the others that are out there that need the help for them to go to heaven as well. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm going to pick up what you said and also what mm-hmm. Sid mentioned earlier in regards to Abraham. I think the story of Abraham pretty much highlight the, the whole gospel in a, in a, in a sense. Um, it expressed the, the clear, um, uh, I guess, vision of God um, from the idea of self-righteousness, right, to righteousness by faith, which is by, you know, him waiting on the Lord to provide himself a, a child versus him actually going out um, getting a, um, a, 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 a concubine to provide himself as his own son right so in the two contrasts of righteousness by faith versus your own self uh, self self righteous and also also express to you at the end of time also the two people that will be that will be saved is one one person that is also being um, justified by faith in in God in, or in Christ 
in the other person that will be trying to justify that by themselves, by their own works, by their own merit, by their own way, and also showing the contrast also with um, how God also have um, made a covenant. It's not only with just the um, just the uh, Jew, he, although he have his own covenant, right? He created for the end of time, but both Jews and Gentiles could be partaker of, of that covenant because Abraham was not a was not a Jew; he was a Gentile. And showing that anybody, like you mentioned, that is uh, that is willing to to accept the call and, and and enter into that covenant with God could be saved. So that's why our high calling right now as Christian is to get everybody right to express to them the covenant that is found in God. In God. And as, it, as, as they understand the covenant in God, as they understand what God will provide to them by being part of the covenant, right? All the blessing, all the, all the prosperity, all the protection, all the knowledge, all the, all the peace in, 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 in not being so stressful about life perplexity, right? Once they understand all these things, it'll give them a, a blessed hope to come and be partake of that covenant so they can go to heaven also like everybody else. Yeah, and I wanted to um, to add too. Like, I was thinking, like when you think about um, names as well in the Bible, um, I think it gives us a way of understanding pretty much God's promises. Because you look at um, the name that God gave him, you know, Abram, Abraham, to being a father of many nations. I mean, in a sense, when God gives us a name, He gives us an identity and He gives us a mission. But He can't be a father of many nations without the Father, you know? He can't necessarily fulfill that identity or fulfill that purpose without the person who gave him that name um, in the first place. So I think that whenever God is giving us a name, it's teaching us to depend on the person who gave us that name. Um, because if you look at it, like think about it, God is always in the business of giving us new names. Like without God, we are broken. Without God, we're lost. Without God, we are fallen. But through God, he gives us a new name. Through God, we can be redeemed. We can go from being broken to being healed. We can go from being lost to being saved. And we can go from being pretty much hopeless to actually becoming saints of God. So I think whenever God is giving us a name, it teaches us to just lean and to depend on the person who gave us that name in the first place. Amen. All right, so does anybody else have anything else to add? Mm, okay. All right, so we're going to move to Thursday, which is covenant obligations. All right, it says, as we have seen so far, the covenant is always a covenant of grace, of God doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. There is no exception in the covenant with Abraham. In his, gr in his grace, God has chosen Abraham as his instrument to assist in proclaiming the plan of salvation to the world. God's fulfillment of his, of his covenant promises was, however, linked to Abraham's willingness to do righteous righteously and to obey, obey him by faith. Without that obedience on Abraham's part, God cannot use him. Genesis 18 verse 19 demonstrates how, um, how grace and law are related. It opens with, with, um, with grace. I know him and is followed by the fact that Abraham is someone who will obey the Lord and have his, have his family obey as well. Faith and works then appears here in close union as they must. The blessing of the covenant could not be enjoyed or maintained unless certain conditions were met by the benefi beneficiaries. Though the conditions were not needed to establish the covenant, meeting them was to be, be the response of love, faith, and obedience. It, it was to be the manifestation of a relationship between humankind and God. Obedience was the means by which God could fulfill his covenant promises to the people. Govern covenant breaking through disobedience is, is unfaithfulness to an, uh, to an established relationship. When the covenant is broken, what is broken is not the condition of bestowal, but the condition of fulfillment. All right. So one thing that I got from this is that... Um, Basically, you're, you're um to basically um build that covenant with God is for you to have faith in Him and to also you know obey His laws, obey His commandments, and basically walk in walk in the footsteps of God. That is that is the way that all of us here today and also the people that are out there for um for us to fulfill that covenant with God is for us to be able to um 
read his word and everything that his everything that the bible says about him everything that the bible says about how we should live we should obey those things and follow within his footsteps so that we may be able to fulfill the covenant to fulfill the covenant that he um bestowed upon abraham which is also bestowed upon us so does anybody else anything to add to that no When I think about covenant obligations, I think about the response to whom the covenant is given to. So, for example, to Abraham, God is saying that, you know, he called Abraham from his country, from his kindred, and he came out. He obeyed God, but in love response to God, he's not saying, okay, you know what? These are the obligations, so I am obliged to follow all of these rules. But rather, it is based on a response of who God is, and by seeing God's hand, leading hand, seeing the invisible God leading him through, you know, the country where he was to where God is bringing him. He's trusting in God, and as a result of that, he is responding to his love, and as well, he's leading his household um, and others to God and showing them, you know, the love of God and, keep, and thereby keeping the covenant. Amen. All right, so we're moving to Friday. Um, I'm just going to go straight to the questions. All right, so it says, um, yeah, let me see, it's two questions, okay. So the first question is, discuss the relationship between faith and works. Can there be one without the other? If not, why not? Does anybody have an answer to that question? Discuss the relationship between faith and works. Can there be one without the other? If not, why not? Um, I think that's a, especially as Seventh Day Adventists, um, we that's that's a question that all of us should uh, have a re really understand. Um, you can't, you can't, you can't. Works is the fruit of your faith. Um, so w you can't work your way to heaven. But because God is in you, you will want to do certain works, if that makes sense. And so when so your faith building is like you don't you don't necessarily build faith through just the work that you do. It's the personal relationship with God and the, the you know, the intimate connection that you have with God daily. That's why you'll see a lot of people where we can go on pulpits and preach a powerful message, but then our life doesn't reflect any of it. And that's the problem that a lot of people have with the church because there's a lot of unconverted people. It's not so much that we don't know scripture or we don't have a knowledge of scripture. It's, it's unconverted hearts, right? And so a lot of times we think that because we're out here, you know, preaching the gospel or we're doing Bible studies or we're doing whatever it is, we feel like we're good with God. In a sense, and God tells you, no one's good with me unless you have a personal relationship with me, no matter what you do. And that's why um, I think it's in Matthew 24 or something like that, or Matthew 7, one of the chapters where you see a bunch of church people saying, God, I did this, this, and this in your name. And God says, depart from me, workers of iniquity. I never knew you. He's not talking to people in the world. He's talking to people in the church that, quote, unquote, did works because it was their lack, lack of faith. And again, I'll repeat Noah he was deemed righteousness by faith. Before he did anything, he believed. And so you can't have one without the other. Um, the way I understand um, works and faith, um, like, like, like I got um, mentioned, like Mono mentioned, I think you can't have one without ano another if you are in Christ. So there's a difference between um, self-righteousness, which is your own works, right? And that's where a lot of, a lot of other churches or a lot of people get, get um, get fall into a into a ditch in the most in a sense they, they people say okay i'm a seven Adventist. i'm going to keep the sabbath once you say i'm going to do something or i'm going i'm going to accomplish this i'm going to do something or i'm going to do that i'm going to do this then you automatically in dangerous ground because all the law of god and all, everything that god acts of us is a spiritual things it is not something that you could do of your own it is a gift of god so the, the way you, you, you manifest faith is that you allow God to come in, in, inside your life 
and to be, to bring a transformation in you, and then now God is the one that's working in you to do into uh, to do into will according to His good pleasure, and now He convict you that you need to do this, and then He, he uh, as as James mentioned, He uh, He uphold you by His right hand so you don't fall, right? So the way faith and work works for me is like once you have God, um, the Holy Spirit in you, the Holy Spirit f um, produce good works, but somebody can go out there and do works. And it's not led by the Holy Spirit. So you must understand, okay, do you have the Holy Spirit? It is the Holy Spirit that does the good works in you. But anybody could go out there and say, I'm doing good work, and still don't have the Holy Spirit. And that's how you have the difference between, okay, one, one, one person is doing it by faith, and one person is doing it by works. Holy Spirit and no Holy Spirit. All right, so that's a very good question, and uh, James to speak greatly about faith and works. Um, kind of want to touch up on the Pharisees and and uh, Romans nine verse um, thirty one and thirty two. It, it says, "But Israel, which follow after the law of righteousness, have not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, and that's a question, because they sought it not by faith." but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumble at that stumbling stone. So the work of the, or the law became a stumbling block for them because they think they could achieve it or keep it by their works, and that's what they went wrong. But James 2 verse 26 kind of put it uh, nicely together. It says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. First we begin with faith because um, our, our works are uh, it's pretty image. It's pretty much filthy rags. It don't mean nothing with Christ. But because of the faith you have in Christ, your works will testify of that. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm looking at um, question two. So I just want to basically... Um, yeah, so um, question two, it was basically... So I'm going to just do like a quick little summary of the question. So basically, it's at, um, it's asking has ha have you ever like experienced like a like have you ever experienced like um God basically um changing certain things within your life for the better. So one thing um so I looked at that question and I I like I can act I can actually um relate to it. So there's certain people that I, I I hanged around with back then that I don't hang around with today, and today now i'm realizing like okay so i'm like now i'm realizing god like you know moved those people out of my life for a reason he took those people out of my life for a reason so um like today so like um like today i don't have i don't have like many friends like back then i, I would have a lot of people that i would call my friends but you know now i'm like you know selective on who who i consider a friend and who i consider like who i associate myself with because there's certain people out here like they're just not some, like certain people so like I would always be like the person to um put people over myself like I would always put the concern of other people and you know like their 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 well-being over my own well-being and myself and I realized that some people even no matter how much you try to help them you my, my I can't help them myself the only person that could help them at the end of the day is God Cause I would try to, I would try my best to, you know, like help them through like rough situations and certain things like that. But they'll just continue to go right back to the same things that they were doing. And God basically eliminated those people from my life, not because, um, well, he, 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 um, I realized that he eliminated those people from my life because they were being detrimental to my own health and well-being and my mental health. Because I, w I would, I would sit there and worry about those people so much and not worry about myself. And I would realize, like, you know. Like my 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 spiritual walk with God was like decreasing. Like everything, like every my mental health was decreasing. Like I couldn't focus when when it came to school and certain things like that. So, um, so it's not like uh, oh I don't care about those people anymore. But you know, like God is like okay, these people you have to stay away from them and like you know just like you know focus on yourself for right now. Try to get try to b try to build yourself up. Build um make um try to build yourself up and you know, get closer to me, and, like, I start, and, like, even to this day, I'm still continuing with that journey, and honestly, I'd like to thank God for, like, you know, eliminating those certain people from my life, because it's, like, they were, like, leeches, they were just leeching off of me, and, like, you know, just trying to, um, 
basically leeching off of me and everything because they knew like i was like they knew i was a kind-hearted person like they would leech off of me and try to like you know um take advantage of my my kindness so i like to thank god for allowing me to remove myself from those people and for me to and thank him for the for me being in the position that i am today all right so does anybody else have anything to add to comment on what you just said as far as the friends and the other aspect of that as well is as you are maturing in Christ the friends you used to hang out with um, you no longer it's like it's going to decrease like the time you used to spend with that person is going to decrease more and more because you are heading in two different direction let's say you guys used to smoke or whatever and that was like your smoking partner but the you spending more time with God now you no longer have interest in smoking you naturally going to depart from that person even though you may care generally for that person but because you are heading into different uh, direction you're naturally going to uh, depart and the bible says can two walk together lest they agree um so a lot of time a uh, majority of us where we used to be is not where we are now so the friends we used to have we don't have them no more and that's actually that's a blessing because let's say you still have the friends that you grew up with and that you used to do the same thing with it kind of tells you the spiritual life of where you, are you still kind of living a lukewarm life are you still entertaining the same smoking habit even though you profess to be Christ? So these guys, because I remember when I, when I got um, serious with Christ, the people I used to go out with, they are no longer here. Like I still care for them, and eventually I still want to witness to them, but they no longer call me because they know that these things did not interest me anymore. So you kind of find out that relationship was really fickle. It was not really a true relationship because it was only built on what you had in common. And since that's taken out, you kind of realize that we, we, we were not really friends. We were just doing the same thing, but we was not really friends. So praise be to God. Amen. I All right, so. Oh. Yeah, I think we, we got to cut off. Okay, I'll say the last comment and then we'll cut off. <laughs> I, I think um, one thing that uh, all of us should realize is that when we look at, like, where God has brought in us and we look at, like, you know, living a godly life, you know, we can say thank God that we don't have to do it ourselves and that it's God in us that allows us to do these things. And one way I like to look at the Ten Commandments is, like, don't so much look at it as a command, but look at them as promises. So with God in you, you will not kill. You will not steal. You will not bear false witness. You'll want to do these things. So the commandments will turn from commandments to things that you naturally love to do. Because all of us as human beings, we're faithful to what we love. And when we learn to love Christ, then we'll love righteousness. All right. So um, thank you all for, you know, participating within the lesson. So uh, before we end, we're going to do a quick word of prayer. Dear Most Kind and Gracious Father, thank you once again for this wonderful Sabbath day that you've given us, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to be able to congregate here, Lord. And for the ones that weren't able to congregate here, thank you for allowing them to be able to um, tune in while they're at home, Lord. Lord, I just please ask that you please continue to bless us, comp continue to be with us, Lord. Continue to, um, you know, help us within um, our walk with you, Lord. Allow us to be able to build a closer relationship with you. Allow us to be able to build a closer bond with you and understand you more each and every day, Lord, as we um, continue to read your word, Lord. Lord, please ask that you please allow each and every individual that is in here right now, Lord, or the ones that are listening, Lord, or even the ones that weren't here, Lord, allow them to be able to, um, allow them to be able to continue to um, build that covenant with you, Lord. Allow them to be able to um, continue to, to continue to um, um, walk within your footsteps, Lord. Allow them to be able to continue to follow your laws. Allow them to be able to be obedient to you, Lord. So that um, we may um, be able to um, spread the gospel within, to spread the gospel with you know, each and every person that we come across with our community, um, with the people um, within our workplaces, Lord, with the people that um, we associate our, associate ourselves with, Lord. Lord, just please ask you, please continue to be with us, God and protect us. Peace be with you, our sins. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.
All right, good um, evening, everyone, and happy Sabbath. <coughs> um, and we were going to transition to our song service this morning or this afternoon. Uh, we ask that everybody please participate in our song service and please sing along with us. And please, I don't want to see no, no hush mouth and looking faces. I want to see some more moving mouth and active, con you know, active people today. You know, it's not a show. So let us sing along. We will do our first hymn. It will be number 487, I Come to the Garden Alone. Number 487. Uh, and before we start, we just have a quick word of prayer. Um, dear most loving Father, Lord, thank you once again for the opportunity of allowing us to come to your sanctuary, Lord, this afternoon, Lord, that we may worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord. We pray that this um, evening, Lord, that our worship and our, and our praises may be acceptable in your sight. We pray that you may please forgive us of our sin and hide us behind the cross, Lord. And all these things we ask, Lord, in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Number 487, I come to the garden alone. Still nearer, number three oh one, nearer, still nearer.
to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. You know how we do this one? I'll do the first stanza, and the congregation would do what? The second stanza, and then it'll come back to me, and then I'll do the last. I'll do this. Go back and forth, because I'm seeing not enough moving mouth from you guys. Mono. All right? All right. That's number 590, Five. trust and obey. I'll do the first stanza. You guys do the next stanza. I'll do the following one. we go back and forth, all right? 590. 590, trust and obey. Fear only trust and 
I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your love, kindness, and your truth. For you have magnified your words above all your name called to worship. kind heavenly father on this sabbath day lord we invite your presence lord we know that today that you have in store for us a blessing so we pray O oh lord that as we worship you in spirit and in the truth O oh lord that you will come into our hearts O oh lord and that you will open um, our minds so that we might be impressed by your spirit forgive us for what we have fallen thank you for bringing us to another sabbath day in jesus name we pray amen Happy Sabbath Church. Ha okay, I'm going to try one, this one, 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 one more time. Happy Sabbath Church. All right. Um, are you guys happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning or this afternoon? All right. So we want to say welcome to the house of the Lord. Uh, I know this is um, a routine for us. We see each other every Sabbath. But we want to thank, say thank you guys for continuing coming in service, for uh, participating with us, for coming to hear the word of God, where all the other churches are closed because people are scared of coronavirus. But you have taken the time out to come still, come week in and week out to come to the sanctuary that we may worship in spirit and truth. We say thank you guys and, you know, and a warm welcome to all you guys um, this afternoon. Um, to start our service this afternoon, we'll, um, we'll stand, stand together for our opening hymn, right? Um, our opening hymn is number, give me one second and give you the number for the opening hymn. Our opening hymn is number 295, Chief of Sinners. Chief of sinner though I be, Jesus shed his blood for me, died that I might live on high, died that I might never die, as the breast is to the vine, I am Thank you. 
Good evening and the Happy Sabbath Church family. May we may you please uh, kneel down. to live out this day according to your will. Lord, help us to keep the Sabbath day holy, not just in our words and our actions, but also in our thoughts as well, because it is from our thoughts that our words and our actions spring forth. So please, Lord, help us to fully enjoy the Sabbath and let this Sabbath be a blessing to all of us. And I also ask you to please help us to continue to grow spiritually. Lord, we need you more in our lives, so please draw us closer to you. And may we be a shining light in this world of darkness. Lord, there are many souls out there that need to be saved. Help us to live out the gospel so that when we preach, our words will not fall flat. And so we thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you for all the things that you have done for us. We thank you for all the blessings you have given to us, even though we don't deserve it. And we ask you to please continue to be with us. And so, Lord, keep us from sin so that, me we, so that we may be free from pain. And in the end, let your will for each and every one of our lives be done. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. I ask this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. May our life be transformed by your love. May our souls be refreshed from above. At this moment, let people everywhere join us now. Now be seated. I'm back again. Now is the time for a talent offering. Um, I know it's very informal, but um, 
if you are watching online or if you're in person, if you want to give your time and offering, um, we encourage you guys to continue to give your time and offering. You could go online and um, if you're watching online, you will see the thing on the bottom of the screen for the Cash App or I guess the Zelle where you could send your um, your time and offering. Or if you want to send it in person, you can come to the church, stop by and see one of the church elders or one of the leaders in the church and give out your time and offering. Uh, and also, if you're in person, you want to give a time and offering, uh, you can see any, any any one of the staff here and then you can give your time and offering. Um, we pray that you may please continue to be encouraged in doing so. Although church is not open formally, but the work needs still need to be done and the gospel needs still need to be pushed forward. So whatever mean God has provided to you, so use your mean to further the gospel. So uh, with that being said, um, if you are struggling financially or you're looking for a job, always trust that God is almighty, as we learned in our lesson this morning, that he will provide whatever the desire of your heart is. So you may trust in him that when he provides for you, whatever you desire, that you may come and give him a blessing, the 10% that he requires of you. So with that being said, we'll just go ahead and have a quick word of prayer and um, and then um, and close our time and offering session very short. Uh, then most of all, Father, Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, once again for allowing us to come to your sanctuary, Lord. Um, as we um, see the need, Lord, for giving our time and offering, Lord, you have called us, Lord, to bring um, a meat into the storehouse, Lord, that it be meat in your house. So, Lord, please, Lord, be blessed us if we don't have financially. And if the, for, the, for the few of us that do have it financially, help us to be encouraged so that we will continue to give our time and offering so the gospel will continue to, um, to continue to grow and then people can, and so could be rich out there. We pray that you may please bless us, Lord, and enlarge our territory, Lord. Do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And most importantly, Lord, forgive us of all our sins. In Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning. It is a blessing to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen? The, the psalmist says how pleasant and how good it is for us to be in the house of the Lord. You know, did you know that the Bible says that I'd rather be a gatekeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in tents of wickedness? So it is a blessing to, even if you're at the door, you're keeping the gate. It's, you still will receive a blessing. Why? Because you're hearing the word of the Lord. And I believe that the Lord has a message for his people today, this morning. And this message is very dear and near to me. And I pray that as I speak, that the Lord will bless your hearts and that his words, not my words, that his words will lodge in your hearts. So the title for this sermon will be, I'm a little excited, so uh, bear with me. <laughs> so the, the title for this message will be, have, what have I any more to do with idols? What is the, what is the sermon title? What have I any more to do with idols? And with that, let us kneel for prayer for those who are able. Dear most kind, gracious heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful that you have allowed us to come to your course today, dear Lord. We're, thank, we're thankful that you have brought us through another week, dear Lord. And as we contemplate and meditate on your word, O oh Lord, that we ask for forgiveness. We ask that you remove every distraction, that you remove every hindrance, O oh Lord, that is preventing us from hearing this word. Dear Lord, when the question was asked, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof? There was not found any man that could open the book and to loose the seven seals. But there was one, one who was from the line of the tribe of Judah, was found worthy to open that book. So, dear Lord, we ask, O oh Lord, that you will make us worthy because us of ourselves are not worthy. So, please be with me. Speak to me and through me so that your words will find enlargement in our hearts so that it might bear fruit and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What have I any more to do with idols? So, we see that the Bible says that God is love, right? The Bible says that he that knoweth, he that loveth not, knoweth not God. For God is 
love. The Bible also says that we first love him because he first loved us. So we see that God is a God of love. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says that in the beginning, God, who is love, created the heavens and the earth, right? And, we're, and, we're, and that the earth was formless and so on and so forth. In the book of Patience and Prophets, um, looking at page 305, paragraph 4, it says, Jehovah, the eternal, self-existent, created one, himself, the source and sustainer of all, is alone entitled to supreme reverence and worship. So who is entitled to supreme reverence and worship? Jehovah, right? And the Bible also says in the book of Mark, we're looking at Mark, the 12th chapter, verses 29 and 30. If you, t- if you could turn there with me, Mark, we're looking at chapter 12, verses 29 and 30. It reads, it says, and Jesus answered him, the first of all commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with, thy, with all thy heart, with all thine soul, with, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. So how does the Lord want us to love him? What, what is the command? With all of our hearts, strength, soul, strength and might, right? So wouldn't you say that this requires everything? Everything, right? So here we see that God, we see God as the creator, but not only that, but the ruler, Lord, and sustainer who alone is deserving of all of our desires, devotions, and affections. So I have a question here. What is one thing that God has given to every creature to be exercised? Faith, okay, good. Any other take? What is one thing that God does not force, but he has given every person to exercise? Will. The will, right? I have another question. So what happens when the will is not yielded to God? It's evil, right? It's bent to destruction, right? What happens when it is exercised in the wrong direction, and does not and fail to give God the glory. Evil, right? And you know what also leads to? Idolatry. It leads to idolatry. Because when the will is exercised towards God, it, it becomes one with God and it carry out the purposes and the will of God in our lives. But when it is contrary, when it is at odd purposes, it leads to idolatry. So what is an idol? An idol is anything on which we set our affections, that to which we indulge in excessive and sinful attachment. Also here it says that an idol is anything which usurps. That is to take the place of, by force, if necessary. Anything which usurps the place of God in the hearts of his rational creatures. Would you say God's creatures is rational? Yeah, they have a mind, right? They think, right? But the idol wants to take that away from the heart. It wants to uproot God from the heart, and it wants to find a seed in there. So the idol does not need an invitation. All it needs is accessibility in an empty vessel. And once it has that access, and once it finds that empty vessel, it can find its lodgment. The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians Chapter 6, verse 16, it says, And what agreement have the temple of God with idols? There is no agreement there. For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So as we look at the story of Adam and Eve, we're looking at Adam. What was Adam's idol? It was Eve, but I'm looking for something else, like like something that kind of like real meat, that will reel somebody in. Self? Huh? Okay. Yes, yes. Those are good answers, right? So here in um, first, first Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, page 21, it says that a struggle appeared to be going on in his mind. This is after, after Eve ate the fruit, right? 
a struggle appeared to be going on in his mind. He goes on to say that his love for Eve was strong. What was strong? Was it stronger than God? Right? And it, go, it goes on to say that in an utter discouragement, he resolved to share her faith. Later on, it goes on to say that Adam, through his love for Eve, disobeyed the commandment of God and fell with her. So what was the idol of Adam? His love for Eve. When his love for Eve became stronger than his love and devotion for God, he chose to share her faith. And look, look, look where we are today. <laughs> what about Eve? What was Eve's, what, what was Eve's idol? To be wise. Praise God. Right? Uh, there's, there's a small uh, quotation here. I'm just going to read a few words. It says that the irreverent curiosity, a restless, inquisitive desire to penetrate the secrets of God's wisdom and divine power. So it was wisdom, but she wanted to investigate. She wanted to know why God has permitted us not to partake of the fruit, right? The scripture tells us in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, it says that the secret things belong unto the Lord, our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So was it revealed unto Eve? It was not revealed unto Eve. Why? You should not eat of this fruit. The command simply was not to eat of it. But God didn't reveal, reveal, reveal anything further. Are you with me? But she wanted to seek out. It was a curiosity that she wanted to seek out. What about Jacob? What was Jacob's idol? The birthright, right? The spiritual birthright. Now, is there anything wrong having spiritual birthright? There's nothing wrong with it. But notice what, what it says here. Uh, this is found in the book of Patriots and Prophets, looking at page 178, paragraph 3. It says, with secret longing, he listened to all that his father told concerning the spiritual birthright. He carefully treasured what he had learned from his mother. Now, catch this. It says, day and night, the subject occupied his thoughts until it became the absorbing interest of his life. It goes on to say that he constantly studied to devise some way whereby he might secure the blessing which his brother held so lightly, but which was so precious to himself. So what did Jacob do? Day by day, he sought for the birthright, right? It was on his mind to the point where it absorbed his interest. So the interest for the birthright, although the love for the birthright was more than God. That is when it became an idol. What about Balaam? Balaam is an interesting uh, character. Money, right? Notice what it says here. It says that Balaam loved the wages of unrighteousness. That is 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. It goes on to say that the sin of covetousness, which God declares to be idolatry, had made him a time server. And through this one fault... Satan gained entire control of him through this what fault? This one fault, covetousness after money, right? It was this that caused his ruin. This one fault, this idolatry of seeking for the mammon un of unrighteousness. Now, we know that with sin, there's no limit. And so, so is uh, the idolatry. When God was establishing Israel as a nation, right, but not only as a nation, but as a church that was supposed to be incorporated under the govern governor of God, one of the first things that he told them to do, do not look at the other nations around you, what they are doing, because they are making a similitude or a false rep representation of a deity. And through that, they were seeking to resemble the deity and thereby give homage, and worship. So God told him not to do that. And we see here that through the idolatrous practices, the people, they became so corrupt that it led them to demonism. And that's the ritual of sacrif sacrificial killing of their own little children. So 
Israel went from worshiping graven images as they was looking at the other nations around them, and they went further and further into apostasy and idolatry to the point where they even sacrificed their children to pass through the fire. And that's how much idolatry could get you into. The Bible says in the book of Psalms 135, Psalms 135, verse 15 through 18. I'll just summarize it. Um, Psalms 135, 15 through 18. So here it's talking about the idols of the heathen, right? It's saying that they're mute, they're blind, they're deaf, they cannot handle, right? And then verse 18 says that they that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusted in them. So those who make the graven images and their idols, right? Who do they go to? They go to their idols, right? And it was known that those who practice idolatry, they were seeking for not only for spiritual um, benefit, but also for like for physical, physical benefits, right? So they would depend on their idols. They would go to their idols where they would erect um, different, um, you, know, um, wor- you know, statues or whatever. They would erect that and they, they would worship them, right? So they, they, they depend on their idols for, uh, for, for their tillage of the land, right? Not only that, for, but for wealth and also um, a, a, any and everything that has to do with life. So they depend on their idols. Now, worship was designed to transform, transform us, but when you get into idolatry, it's about transforming God. You're saying that I'm going to make him into what I want. So rather from being changed into God's glory and image, God is being changed into the image that you have desired him to be. And so in other words, you're lowering God and you bring, you bring God to a lower level, to, to the human conception. Now, notice what it says here. There's a quotation uh, from Patriots of Prophets, page 95 talking about those who lived before the flood. It says that the men of that generation were not all, in the fullest acceptation of the term, idolaters. Many professed to be worshipers of God. They claimed that their idols were representations of the deity and that through them, the people could obtain a clearer conception of the divine being. So the same practice was being promulgated back then. Right? And it goes on to say that this class were foremost and rejecting the preaching of Noah. Through the practice of idolatry, it led them to reject the message. It goes on to say that as they endeavored to represent God by material objects, their minds were blinded to his majesty and power, and they ceased to realize the holiness of his character. And, and that's what it would do. Idolatry will blind you if you continue to practice that sin or whatever that you're coveting is going to blind you to the point where you don't see sin the sa- in the same light or manner that God sees it. So what about today? Do we have modern day idolatry? Very much so, right? Is, I- is idolatry well and alive today? Absolutely, right? And idolatry is pretty much anything that is more important to you than God. If you think about it, if you were to examine your life, yourself, anything that absorbs your heart and your imagination more than God, that you seek to give what only God can give, that is idolatry. And when we think about um, Lucifer, for example, um, what was Lucifer? covetousness like what did he covet what did he idol it was God's power right it was God's power to the point where he wanted to dethrone God notice what Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12 says I want to show you something here Isaiah 14 we're going to know we're going to know what Lucifer said in his heart We're going to read from verse 12 through 12 and 13. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? 
How art thou cut down to the ground, which this week in the nation? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. So what was the first thing that Lucifer said in his heart? I will ascend into heaven. So what was Lucifer trying to say here? Turn with me to Romans 10. We're going to find how the Bible define that. Romans 10, and we're looking at we're looking at verse 6. Romans 10, verse 6. So Lucifer said, I will ascend into heaven. So what does that mean? It says, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? And what does that mean? That is to bring Christ down from above. So when Lucifer said, I will ascend, I will ascend into heaven. So he was trying to dethrone Christ. He was trying to usurp the authority of God. Because Christ lodged in the heart of every, every one of his creation. So he didn't only want his power, but he wanted to dethrone God. To the point where he was now sitting in God's place. Have mercy. Would you imagine how that would be like? And not only that, not only did he covet or did he idol power, he also coveted himself. He idol himself, right? His beauty, his surpassing beauty and wisdom, that was an idol to him. When he began to see how bright he was in terms of his beauty and his wisdom, he coveted that to the point where he said, look at me. Like, this, is, this couldn't be from God. This is all for myself. So we're looking at modern day idolatry. And I have five, I have listed five of w- what is considered to be more important to us than God, which is modern day idolatry. The first one is money. How did you know that? <laughs> so who, who, who here doesn't love money? God is still working on you. Praise God, brother. <laughs> so is money bad? No. Money's not bad. Right? Because we know that money is a means that God has entrusted to us so that we can bless humanity, not ourselves. Humanity. Now, money is not the problem. It is how we use what God has given us. Right? It is our view of it that can become a problem. Now, the pursuit the desire and the love of money to the point where it leads the mind away from God, it is, it is, it, it is at that point where it, where it becomes an idol, right? And, and if you think about it, you know, in a practical sense, uh, we go to work, we, w- we work for our wages and our paycheck, right? We're looking for the paycheck, right? We trust in the money to provide for us, to care for us, and also to protect us, you know? And this is where it becomes a problem. And the Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes that money answers all things, right? And I thought that was an interesting text. But as I began to look into it a little bit more deeper, I realized that money cannot buy happiness. Money does not answer the problem to depression. Money does not cure, doesn't, cannot heal an incurable disease, right? Money is only a means that God has given unto us. But when we use it to that excess where God, God all of a sudden becomes blinded, it is at that point where it pulls us away from God. For the Bible says that you cannot serve God and money because God is greater than money. God can supply our needs. It's just putting that simple trust and faith in him and believing that he will take us or carry us from day to day. The next one here I have is entertainment. 
how many of us love to be entertained? Right? Uh, whether it's Netflix, ne Netflix um, playing video games, watching a, a game on TV, we just sit back, you know, uh, I just want to be entertained. Like, I've already worked, I'm tired, this is my day off, I just want to be, can't you leave me alone? I want to be entertained. Right? So, the pursuit of entertainment has become, wh when the pursuit of entertainment has become the ultimate thing in the life, that is when it leads to that excess and thereby becomes an idol. But entertainment is, you know, it's not bad of itself, you know, in terms of creation. Even, even recreation can be, can be harmed you know, in some way or some fashion. And, and if you think about those who, who are living in third world countries, you know, they, they wish they had some form of entertainment because the life is not easy as it is here in the we Western culture. You know, uh, I would say that the Western culture is rich. I mean, it's abundant if you think of it. Uh, you know, job, although jobs make, Although jobs, oh, jobs may be a little bit scarce for some people, <laughs> but here in the Western culture, we see that we do have opportunity whereby we can have means so that we can enjoy the things that God has given unto us. And you know, it's not bad because it, when you look, when you read Ecclesiastes, the Bible says that you know, I saw, I besought all the things of this earth and he, and saw that it is good for a man to eat, you know, the fruits of his labor, right, to enjoy the fruits of the labor. Now here's another one. Um, this one may be kind of harsh, but I believe this is the second one that is in more pursuit than money. Can you guess what it is? Marriage, relationship, you know, it deals with that. Good job. And you know what that is? Sex. So, sex might be the only idol that we pursue more than money. Or maybe not us here, but <laughs> people in the world, praise God. You know, we have taken that which was intended to be a gift from God, and we turn it into a God. We begin to worship the gift rather than the giver. So in many of our culture, sex is an idol that many are addicted to. Right? Even in the marriage confinement, it can be used to excess. And instead of using that gift that God has given, we're simply using that to please ourselves. And if we indulge or continue to indulge in that, it can lead to excess. Sexual tra transmitted diseases and so on and so forth. The list goes on and on. The next one that I have on here is I thought about this one. Comfort. Comfort. I mean, there's nothing wrong with um, seeking comfort, right? If you have a loved one that passed away, you want to be comforted, right? But this is not the type of comfort. This type of comfort is, is, a, is, is where we become comfortable, right? It's where we... Instead of seeking to help humanity who are suffering, we say, you know what? I want to dedicate, you know, some time to myself, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna live comfortably, right? This is why we see in um, Laodicea. This is why the Lord spew, spews the church out of His mouth because they're in between. They're too comfortable. They're rich. They're luxuriant, and wealth and wealth of the scripture, whether it is wealth or the things that God has given us. And the world offer an endless amount of products that seems to be prom promising that will add comfort to our lives. But as a Christian, should not we live in such a manner that will help us to, you know, get un become uncomfortable? Because the, the scripture says that all that live in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 
you know, like a- in the early history of the Christian church, there was this, this type of comfort wasn't there because they was fleeing for, from persecution. But especially here in the Western world, again, we're too comfortable. If persecution were to arise, the Bible says that by and by many will be offended. Why? Because we're not used, 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 used to being uncomfortable, right? To be placed in an unfavorable position where we have to answer for our faith or, you know, where we're tried to the point where, you know, it would make, you know, God would work upon our characters and refine us. So the call of the Christian is not to live a comfortable life. The call of of a Christian is to pursue Christ Jesus and to share in his affliction. The next one that I have on here is our phones. Uh, How many of us can honestly say that when we woke up this morning that we did not touch our phones? Touch our phones? Yeah. Or that we have it right next to the bed. It's right there for us. And the first thing we do, we look at the notification, right? We have the smartphone, social media. These are addictions. And again, when, when it leads to, to that excess, it can become a problem. But the phone in of itself is not, it's not a bad thing. As a matter of fact, when you think about the phone, one of the things that makes it an idol is the online presence, and that is the internet. Back in my days, uh, middle school and high school, I didn't have a phone. As a matter of fact, the first, uh, the first time I remember me having a phone, I was like, my goodness, I, I, I was about 21 years old. 21 years old. I didn't have a legit phone. I, I had an iPod. And was, that doesn't count. I'm talking about a phone. <laughs> So I didn't have a phone until I was like 21 years old. Uh, yes, you cannot guess my age. Until I was 21 years old. <laughs> so the online presence has make it even, even harder for us to, to not have a phone. I have a little nephew who is, who is five, five years old now. I remember when he was only two years old, when his little legs received strength and when he, when he was wreaking havoc around the house. And, and his dad gave him a phone, and I'll tell you, this little man knows the phone in and out. Knows YouTube, you know, he came, <laughs> I remember those days, he'll come to my room and try to use my iPad and so on and so forth. And when he tried to deprive the phone away from him, he become kind of like antsy, like, like he just can't, can't do without it. And imagine a little children, a little child like that, having a phone from a tender age, as two to three years old, and they're growing up, right? So the phone could be a world of evil, right? That's why as guardians or parents, we should be watching over our kids, nephews, nieces, to make sure that any, well, it's it's, it's almost impossible to stop nowadays because they'll find ways (laughs) when you're not looking to access the phone. So... To many people, the world revolves around their phones. Even in social media settings, checking your news feed, um, how many likes you had, and so on and so forth. Why? Because you want that, that feeling, right, that only God can satisfy. So these things does not bring any change of heart or transformation of character, right? It leaves No room for God. We can become so absorbed in the daily round of activities that we leave no room for God and his word. And and, and in the end, these idols, anything that we put before God, leaves us unfulfilled and empty. Because we were never intended to satisfy the place of God, the place that God should occupy, or anything um, for these matters, in terms of that which we hold dear to the heart more than God. There's a quotation in Great Controversy, um, the 88, 1888, page 622, paragraph 1. It says that 
we should now acquaint ourselves with God by proving his promises. Angels record every prayer that is earnest and sincere. We should rather dispense selfish gratification than neglect communion with God. Selfish grat gratification, our idols, that which leads to our idols, than neglect communion with God. She goes on to say that we must take time to pray. If we allow our minds to be absorbed by worldly interest, the Lord may gis give us time by removing from us our idols of gold, houses, and fertile land. So even those who have houses or acres of land, that can become an idol. So what does the Lord do? He removed that from us so that we can spend time with him in prayer and the study of his word. So what would it take to give up our idol? Sacrifice, right? Sacrifice. We have to give up something that is highly valuable. Notice what it says here in our uh, spiritual gift, uh, I mean, spiritual SB, page, <laughs> book one, <laughs> page um, 48. It says, said the angel, think ye that the father yielded up his dearly beloved son without a struggle? No, no, e it was even a struggle with the God of heaven whether to let the guilty Man, whether to let guilty man perish or to give his beloved son to die for them. You know that it was a struggle for God to give up, give up his son? Just like Adam, when Adam knew that Eve sinned, Spirit prophecy, Spirit prophecy said that there was a terrible struggle in his mind. Whether he would give up Eve so that she can die or he would submit to God. It was a terrible struggle. And what did Adam do? He gave up Eve. But with the father, the father even had a struggle himself. He had to make a decision. Whether the God of heaven will allow guilty man to perish or to give his beloved son to the world. And what did he do? He gave his beloved son to the world. We read in John 3.16 that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now I'm going to turn to Hosea. Hosea 3. I'm going to turn to Hosea, and I'm just going to read a couple of verses here. Because when we read the book of Hosea, we see that, you know, God told Hosea to marry a what? A harlot, right? So God was teaching Israel a lesson, right? And many times through scripture, we see that God is telling that, oh, you know, um, Israel or Ephraim is like a silly dove, right? He is easily gone into sin. We read again that it says that, oh, Israel, you have destroyed yourself. Israel, you are drawn into your idols. Leave him alone. So many times we see that God is dealing with his people, right? But notice what it says here in the book of Hosea, chapter 15. No, not 15. 11, verse 8. So we know that the father gave up his only begotten son, right? Now, if you notice in the book of Hosea, 11, verse 8, it says, it says this. It says, how shall I, shall I give thee, Ephraim? How, and I'm wrapping up. I'm getting ready to close. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, O Israel? How shall I make thee as Adath, Adma? How shall I set thee as Zeboam? My heart is turned within me. My repentance are kindled together. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim. I am God and not man. So here, God is pleading with his people. He's saying, how can I give you up? How can I give up my beloved? And in chapter 14, the whole chapter is a beautiful chapter. Whenever you get a chance to read it of Hosea, we're seeing that there is a plea to return to the Lord. And with that plea, there is a promise of full redemption. The Bible says here in the book of Hosea, chapter 14, verse 1, it says that 
here the Lord is playing with Israel and, and Ephraim. He's saying, return unto me, O Israel. Return unto the Lord your God. For you have fallen by your iniquity. Take with you words and turn to the Lord and say unto him, take away all my iniquity and receive us graciously. And with that also, here it says that Asher will not save you. Your gods will not save you. That which you put your trust in, that which you love more will not save you. Neither will we say any more to the work of our hands. That which our minds have fashioned to be into an idol. Here it's saying that these will not save you. And then God is giving them the promises of full redemption. If you look at verses 4 through 7, God is saying that I will heal your backslidings. I will be as the dude unto Israel. His branches shall spread, and so on and so forth. So God is making full promises of redemption. And in verse 8, notice how Ephraim responds. Notice how Ephraim responds to the plea to return to the Lord and to the promises that God has given to Ephraim. It says, Ephraim shall say, what have I to do any more with idols? What have I, Lord, to do any more with idols? Lord, I have heard you. I have heard him and observed him. So Ephraim, Israel, came to his senses. He realized that this idol that he is holding onto, that things which he had placed as more important than God, is destroying him. It's eating him alive. He is joined to this idol. He cannot let go of himself. So here, Ephraim is pondering and he's asking this question. What have I any more to do with, it, with idols? I have heard the call of salvation. I have heard the call of repentance. And guess what? Ephraim has responded. The Bible says that there's only one thing that God asks us to give. And that is our hearts. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 23, verse 26, he says, my son, my daughter, give me your heart. Because in the heart is where you find the idol. In the heart is, what, is where you find the thing that is separating you from God. You want to do right, but you cannot. But God is saying that I will partner with you. I will cooperate with you. Give me your heart. Not only that, but let your eyes. Do not observe your family members. Do not observe your friends. Let your eyes observe my ways. The Bible says in the book of Psalms 68, 24, they have seen thy goings, O God, even the goings of my God, my king, and the sanctuary. They have observed God in the sanctuary through the sacrifice, the holy place, in the most holy place. They have behold him. In the garden of Gethsemane, they have behold him in the wilderness of temptation. They have behold his goings. It says that they have observed him. And it says that I am like a green fir tree. Evergreen. And then it ends here. From me is thy fruit found. And on the contrary, those who decide to keep their idols. There's one more person I want to look at and then I'll close. And that is Judas. Who's Judas' idol? Notice what the Bible says here in the book of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 1 through 5. And I'll summarize it. It says that all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel together against Jesus to put him to death. And they delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. And when Judas realized that the idol that he held was of no use or benefit, guess what he did? 
he went back to the chief priests and the elders of the people. And the Bible records this as this. That he brought the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. And he confessed to them. He said, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the only innocent blood. And what was their response? What is this to us? Do something when you handle it. You take care of this matter. This has nothing to do with us. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple. And guess what was his end? He departed and he hanged himself. What did Jesus, what does Judas do? What did Judas do? He hanged himself, right? He dispensed his idol before the chief priests and the elders. It left him unsatisfied, frustrated, and in utter discouragement to the point where he left and he hanged himself. The Bible, the songwriter says this. It says, the dearest idol I have known. Whatever that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. It is only with God's help we can remove the idols in our life. There is no way that we of ourselves can remove the thing that is stopping us from having that relationship with God. Whatever that idol be, Lord, by your grace and your mercy, for you, from you, O oh Lord, is my help. Help me, dear God, to tear down this idol from the throne room where you sat down, where this idol is not replacing your throne. Help me by your grace and your mercy to tear down this idol. And do you know what the word, um, the name, because the name has significance. The name Ephraim means double fruit. Double fruit. Early latter rain. Overcomer. this, I will kneel down for prayer. Dear most kind Heavenly Father, Lord, we have that in our hearts, that which is lodging in our hearts that is preventing us to have a more serious relationship with you, Lord. And we know that in and of, of ourselves, we cannot dethrone this idol, dear God. But dear Lord, you have promised that you are able to help us, that if we cooperate with you, we can overcome and thereby by observing you, you will begin to take away the idols from our, from our hearts that these things would grow strangely dim. So dear Lord, again, we ask that you would do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Forgive us what we have fallen, dear God, and we pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit that he may not only convict us and be around us, dear God, but that he will lodge within the place where the idol sat. And this, O oh Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Stand up and stand number 315-04, closer, walk with God. Number 315-04, a closer, walk with God.
causing a separation, a barrier between us and you, then Lord, we ask you to please cast those walls down so that we can grow into a deeper relationship with you because we want to be closer to you as much as we possibly can. And Lord, we just thank you for all that you have done for us. You have done so much to the point where we will never ever be able to thank you enough and we should not be putting anything above you so please lord help us to forsake our idols it is a struggle but through you all things are possible so lord i know that i struggle sometimes with idolatry and i'm sure that some of my brethren here also struggle with it too and lord help us to overcome our idols so that ultimately your name can be glorified and so that we can grow closer to you and as we depart lord continue to be with us and may you please help us to have you in our mind always and once again you know i ask you to please help us to be a light in this dark world help us to make a difference in other people's lives help us to be a blessing to others and so we thank you lord for everything and let your will for our lives be done nothing more nothing less nothing else we ask this all in jesus's wonderful name amen and amen May the light that I leave reflect your glory. May the words that I speak honor your name. All right, guys, you may be seated. Thank you. 